assessment for learning come alive in their school community. Let's welcome Dale. sciences and uh, uh, as I said there throughout all the grades this is the building credibility part if you're wondering where you you know I'm supposed to look like I know what I'm talking about and uh, uh, it has very, been very interesting for me to, to go through this uh, journey on my own in the classroom about assessment practices because um, I guess I've always felt that there's something a little bit wrong about the way we do it. And uh, it's actually been a little bit over 20 years now. I was uh, um, the department head of science at Ross Shepherd High School, one of the six high schools and public high schools that I worked in in my career. Uh, McNally is actually my 14th school, which is crazy when you think about it. And uh, But it's been very, very interesting and lots and lots of fun. I still teach. Uh, I, have, I teach in the uh, International Baccalaureate Program, the Theory of Knowledge class now, and uh, and I'm still coaching, which has been wonderful. I um, coach with the uh, on the football team and the rugby team, and so if you're the football coach from Austin O'Brien, I hate you. <laughs> you might as well just start right there. Why do you have to beat us every year? You know. A couple of years ago, it was minus 32 at foot field. Like minus 32, you can't run when it's minus 32. How do they run the opening kickoff back for a touchdown when it's minus 32? Like that's ridiculous, right? And that was the beginning of a very, very long, very cold day. Anyway, I, this is all about forgiveness also, right? So, yeah. Or no, forgiveness comes later. That's what I heard. Okay. Um, McNally is in the uh, Alberta High School Redesign Program, which uh, I believe many of the high schools here are. And these are the principals that are involved there. The focus piece for McNally School uh, for the five years now that I've been there has been around assessment practices. I truly believe that um, our understanding about assessment will drive many, many, many of the things that we do in our school. And that uh, through this uh, next hour and a bit here, we'll talk about lots of these different pieces and how we uh, had impact on them through our changes in assessment practices. Okay? Like anything that has a lot of terminology around it, assessment, uh, has seen the misuse of many of the terms related to it. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, formative assessment and summative assessment. Uh, probably most people have heard that. Um, the idea of assessment for learning, assessment as learning, assessment of learning. There's all of these things that just get mushed up and confused. So we talk about two different things that we do when we're gathering information about what our kids know. And those two things are either under the umbrella of assessment or the umbrella of evaluation. Okay, That hopefully isn't um, going to just muddy this more for you. But then I put way too many words on this slide, so I'll show them to you bit by bit. This one, uh, we, we talk about assessment, 
we're talking about the things that the students do that show the students where they are and the teacher where they are, right, where the students are. But it also, also shows the teacher the effectiveness of their teaching. Okay? And this is something I think that's, that's kind of lost in the assessment world, is that um, one of the, the real effective pieces of your daily ongoing assessment in your class is that it tells you whether you're doing a good job or not. It's as simple as that. Did the kids understand what I taught today? Okay? And also embedded within this idea of assessment is the idea that we have frequent opportunities to do this and that we learn from that what we know, what we need to know, and as far as the teacher is concerned, uh, how they need to change their teaching. This is all you get this. I mean, this is what you do. Okay? You know if you had a bad lesson, the kids didn't get it, you have to change uh, the teaching for the next day, and I'm going to talk about some of the roadblocks or some of the things that, that block us up in a traditional grading system. Now I should probably also tell you that I, I really don't know a lot about your district assessment policy, about your individual school assessment policies. So we're talking about um, uh, sort of traditional models of assessment here versus uh, some of the, the ones that have been actually in the literature for the last 20 years or so. Okay? So if you're sort of reading that along, I'm not going to uh, embarrass you by reading it to you. But essentially, the, uh, this is all about the, the ongoing daily stuff that you're doing, the learning, the feedback, the, all of that kind of stuff. All right? A lot of um, uh, literature out there will talk about this as formative assessment. Okay, or assessment for learning. You can use those words if you want. Right? The other uh, idea here is around evaluation. Evaluation is different than assessment in, in this. It's uh, uh, the brief thing here. It's a judgment made at a particular point in time. Okay? So it's uh, an exam, or, you know, I, don't, I hesitate to use examples because you'll see as I talk about this that, that it's not uh, as clear cut as it, it seems. I'll shoot this stuff up here for you, right? Based on an accumulation of information, right, we do a whole body of, of teaching and then we want to uh, check to see what the understanding is at that time, right? One of the most uh, critical pieces of this is that the, the evaluations should be the most recent, consistent uh, achievement levels of the students. Right? Now, the stuff that I've shown you up to this point, most people would totally agree. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, we do this in our uh, assessment plan. Yeah, we have quizzes, we talk about it in our classes, we do all of these kinds of things. Right? But it starts to get messed up. And again, uh, the evaluation side, a lot of people uh, we'll refer to this as summative assessments. Okay? So then, here's the question. Um, does the grade book, your Mark's record book, actually make any separation or any indication of a difference in the assessments and in the evaluations? Okay? You know the answer to that. So I'll tell you this, if in your grade book you include a quiz that your students did either this morning, I don't know if you had all day here, so let's say yesterday, so as a chemistry or biology teacher, I'd be halfway through the stoichiometry unit, I give them a quiz, and I want to see what the learning is at that point, and then what do I do with that mark? Okay. So if I truly believe there's a separation between assessment and evaluation, I really shouldn't do anything with that mark, with that number. Okay? Why? Because when I give the kids the quiz or the formative assessment or the assessment for learning or the, whatever that we want to call it, when I give them that quiz to see how well they're doing as they're moving along, 
That is a moment in time which, hopefully, will be changed. And it could be changed within a very few minutes. Example, I give the kids a quiz in my class, they write it, it's a 10 mark quiz, whatever. Uh, a student gets 4 out of 10, and I go over, or they go over, or somehow we start to look at the material, and you know that that 4 out of 10 now becomes historical information. You see the learning happening, you absolutely observe the change in the understanding the student has of that material, even within just a few minutes. Isn't that true? So, if, or I'll back that up. The problem is, you've seen the learning, and we've all done this, you're going over the material, you're talking about it, and the kid goes, oh, that's what you were talking about. Now I get it, right? So, the kid knows they know it, you know they know it, what does the grade book have? The grade book has 4 out of 10. Okay? So now at that moment in time, the grade book is wrong. Make sense to you? Okay? Now, if the practice in your school, like in many traditional schools, or your personal practice, is that you actually uh, will record and wait the formative assessments, the assessments, the assessment for learnings, all of these learning activities, if you're putting those in your grade book and counting them, then you're counting, and if you're agreeing with me on this, you're counting historical evidence of learning at some point down the road. Okay? So the interesting thing is, is that the, if I'm in your class and, it, and at the beginning of class on the quiz, I get 4 out of 10, and then because you're magnificent, you raise my understanding that if I did the quiz at the end of the class, I'd probably get 9 or 10 out of 10. And you, again, you know that, I know that, but the grade book doesn't know that. My question is, what determines the final mark? Is it the kid that knows that he knows more than that four? Is it you that knows that the kid knows more than that four? Or is it the grade book that doesn't reflect? Right? In many traditional systems, it's the grade book. Because that mark is in there, that mark is weighted, and that mark counts. Okay? You have in uh, front of you, or with you, I think when you came in, um, examples of uh, grade book scenarios. Okay? And you can take this away and look at this, but I'd also, at this time, just like you to uh, take a peek at that. And maybe for a, a couple of minutes, uh, talk about it. The last page has some sort of guiding questions around uh, these three scenarios. One of them is uh, what I would refer to as a probably uh, a uh, pretty traditional grade book. If I can find my handout for you now. Okay, and sorry, it's a science class. But it, it uh, breaks up the weighting of the units. I'll tell you that the weighting is arbitrary. Okay, the weighting is not uh, defined by Alberta Education. And so it, it, right there, it may not be consistent through all schools. Okay, and then the unit marks come from things like labs, quizzes, exams, and stuff like that. See? Pretty standard, uh, pretty traditional grade book. Okay? Uh, on the over page, it talks about a, a flexible assessment scheme, which you'll see as we talk about this is more along the lines of what we do at McNally. Okay? Uh, the course mark is determined through the work that the students are doing in the course. And then we run what we call flex-rated finals. A little bit different picture here. And then the, the last one that, that's there, another, uh, there are some schools, and I, I believe even within the division here, uh, there, are, there is some movement around mastery learning, where students don't actually write exams in units until they've demonstrated the, uh, essentially a mastery of the material. 
Make sense? Any questions about that? Some guiding questions then on the back. Um, you know, which assessment scheme do you think re would result in higher grades for students? Which, um, which scheme would you prefer? Uh, maybe that's a, a ridiculous question. If you've answered the first one, it's self-evident which one you'd prefer. Okay. So if you talk about that just for uh, a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, or go to the washroom, or get a drink, or do whatever it is that you do for a couple of minutes. Especially a grade one or two teacher 
in June if they used assessment scores that the student had from October or November. Can you imagine your language arts? Well, yes, you're doing magnificently well. However, you really couldn't read very well in October, so I have to reduce your leading mark. Wouldn't that be absurd? Okay? My question was, when I made the transition to elementary, when does that change? And why does that change? Why is it all of a sudden acceptable that in a full year course, and I'm not sure in your division if you have high schools with full year courses, we do, why would it be anywhere near acceptable to use marks from assessments in October when you're calculating the exit ability of a student? I don't get it. Okay? Really, if I want to be a bit of a, a jerk about this, I could say, are you saying you didn't do anything from October to improve that student's, you know? You know that that's not true. You know that the work that's been done through the year is very valuable. And some of those kids in fits and starts show huge gains in your course. And so, truly, by drawing marks from the beginning through to be used at the end is a misrepresentation of that student's uh, exit ability in your course, I think. Okay? So, what do you do then? Right? When you, and you've looked at this, and the value of this is just for you to look at it and to think about it, uh, whether there's some of these that work in one way or another. The, the real um, question that you would uh, run through in this is the reasons that you would use one or the reasons that you wouldn't. Then you'd have that conversation, well, I would use mastery learning, you know, maybe with my IB kids, I wouldn't use it with my Dash 3 kids, right? There'd be all of these kinds of things that we go through. And those are, again, just opportunities for you to reflect on how you collect grades and how you use them in your grade book. I'd like to talk to you about a whole bunch of things and they're all sitting here uh, at the same time. Right? So, assessment points to consider. Um, uh, it was mentioned at the beginning that the conversation would be about what we do at McNally. And that's certainly not to say, my goodness, your division high schools should start to, to uh, run their assessment practices like we do at McNally. Uh, I'm not here to convince anybody that you should change. I'm not here even to suggest that this is the way it should be. Uh, Rhonda Nixon actually asked me just to come to tell you what we do. And like anything else, you listen to it, think about it, ask me some questions, I hope, and um, you know, take away whatever you take away from this. A question came up during the, your reflection time there that if you're, you're going with a mastery level kind of assessment plan, uh, some kids will hit that mastery level in their fourth grade assessments before other kids do. Right? Well, in any assessment world that you're working in, you know that kids hit their optimum learning targets at different times. Okay? Some very early in the learning, some later on in the learning, some unfortunately after they've left you and they've taken the course again. Right? But that, okay, so that's what happened. The thing is that, that we should construct a, a grade reporting system that is true to what we believe about education. And if we believe that the students come to you at the beginning of the course not knowing the material in the course, okay, I, I used to say you know, is it a shock that kids come to you in, in your uh, Biology 20 class and they don't know Biology 20? That shouldn't be a shock. That should be why they're there. Okay? So if they don't do well at the beginning, that shouldn't be a shock. They're trying to learn this material. It's new to them. Okay? So, uh, there, that, no, no surprises there. Right? So, 
as you're working your way through the course then, and I'd like to just talk about a few of these, if you don't ask any questions, oh, I'll go back to the question that came up. Uh, yes, it's absolutely true that kids will hit achievement uh, scores. Uh, so if you're on a mastery level uh, system in your, in your school, where kids don't write the exams until they demonstrate mastery in the formative work, they'll hit those at different times, and what do you do? Okay, well, uh, what's the easiest thing for me to say here, uh, without making too broad of a statement? Um, because we understand that kids' uh, learning occurs at different rates, when the kids at McNally have achieved at a, a proficiency level that is agreed upon basically by the teacher but getting the parent, uh, then they, and I'll just say it, then they don't come to class anymore. Okay? You went, oh, really? So how do, what does that look like? Right? So I'll, I'll just drop a few um, pieces here and maybe we can stimulate some conversation. In the majority, as a matter of fact, I think in our, our social and English classes, if you're a social or English teacher, uh, there are no uh, deadlines for, the, uh, for assignments. No, not possible. Okay? So, uh, the, the story then, because this is all centered around stories, in the first year I came to McNally, uh, one of my teachers, Courtney Borsnick, you can uh, email her or phone her and ask her about this, she ran this program with her English 20-2 class. Do we have English teachers here? Yes, we must have, right? Do you need English teachers? You can, don't have to be embarrassed about it. You can actually, that's a good job. Right? Math teachers are embarrassed, they won't put up their hands, but English teachers are the, uh, she, So she did this, and, uh, and she tried this with her uh, English 20-2 class. So she told them at the beginning of the year, and so here's another one, I'll tell you a couple things in a row. There aren't any assignments, exams, quizzes, labs, or anything that the students do in their courses at the school that have a predetermined weight to the final mark in the course. Okay? So I can say that again. Uh, there, are, there are no assessments that the students do throughout the year, including the final, that have a predetermined weight to how that will be counted and the, and the determination of the final mark. Okay? No deadlines for assignments, including exams. No deadlines for essays, poetry analysis, you name it. There's no deadline for it. Okay? She did this with her, I, I probably wouldn't have advised that she tried this with her English 20-2 class. Uh, we also, by the way, we, don't, we have the same kids you do, pretty much. They're just kids, right? They just go to school. It's not a pre-selected group, it's nothing. Uh, spectacular, amazing, even though I think they are. Uh, they're just kids. So those kids were told at the very uh, beginning of the year, first of all, none of the things that you do will count, and that's too broad of a statement, but that's basically the way it is, all right? But everything that you do counts, okay? Because it's all about the learning, it's not about the, the mark. And the reason for that is I know when I give you a quiz or when I test you on something during the year, that's only a measure at that time. And then you and I are going to work together to improve that to the best we can possibly get at the end. So I'm going to reserve my judgment about your mark until you're done. My parents don't get and my kids don't ever get a calculated mark in a course through the course. Okay? they will never be able to calculate their actual running percent mark. That includes the full IB students that we have at our school and down to our Dash 3 kids, okay? They cannot, and why can't they? They can't calculate a mark because none of the assignments, assessments, quizzes, exams, or anything else are weighted in the grade book. 
None of them. It's just information. It's exactly your grade book, give or take the, the uh, individual differences, except there's no weighting on the top column. What happens to the kids when you do that? This is the audience participation portion of the presentation. What happens to the kids you think about when you were in school? What would happen if the teacher told you that at the very beginning of the year? What would your response be? Sure, just shout it out. Yeah, what they complain about? She said the kids complain at the beginning, then they get over it. I'm sorry for walking around. Pardon me? They complain that they don't know their, they don't know their mark. That's right. Yeah, then they get used to it, right? What did I do that was wrong? No, there's a, another wireless mic inside. Yeah, there must be, because every time I touch this thing, it makes a, it makes a noise. Yes, so the kids complain at the beginning because they're confused, right? Because they're used to a system. The kids know that they come to your class, they listen to the things that you say, they give that back to you, they generate marks, and they move along. Okay? That's their understanding of this. I'll tell you the understanding of the kids at McNally. In my theory of knowledge class in the spring, I was going to talk to the Edmonton Public School uh, high school principals about assessment practices, right? That was fun. I, I, don't, I mean, it, it was fun. I shouldn't have said it that way because that sounded derogatory. Well, it was fun. It was good. It was, it was, it was very interesting. And I was telling my class that, that uh, I was going to do that the next day. And one of the students, uh, her name's Alexander Paul, uh, she said, wait a minute. So in other high schools, and so think about this. In other high schools, every time I do an assessment for a teacher, I reduce my highest possible mark in that course. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if I write a, a quiz worth 5%, right, and I get 65 or whatever, I, math, I need a math teacher here, right? If I get three out of five on it, we'll go that way. I've lost two marks that are not recoverable. I cannot get those marks back because that's set in the grade book and I lost those marks. And I, I go through the term constantly writing assessments for my teacher and constantly diminishing my highest possible level in that course. So how does that make any sense? Of course, I said, why are you so upset about this? That's not what happens here. He said, well, that's not fair to the kids. The other thing is, and I know I asked you to answer this, she said, where's my motivation to constantly be trying to do the best work I possibly can if everything I do reduces my highest possible mark in that course? Eventually, you know, my highest mark with 100 on the final would be 82 or 72 or whatever. So that doesn't make any sense. Is she wrong? In a traditional grade book where the students are writing uh, weighted assessments throughout the term, they are day by day, week by week, diminishing their highest possible return they can get from that. They are. Okay? So what have we done? We flip that over. None of this is weighted. It's all about the learning. And we are waiting until the most recent consistent performance demonstrations to decide what your final mark in the course will be. If you write a better essay, if you do a better poetry analysis throughout the year, We'll look at the best one that you produce at a consistent level, however that looks. That's going to be your final mark in the course. Flex-weighted finals. Flex-weighted finals are opportunities for kids 
to write uh, comprehensive final exams, right, to in improve their performance in the unit that they didn't do well in. Right? I need people to ask me questions or else I'm just going to talk. There you go. Thank you. Right now, but you know, September and October weren't great. 
So I really can't let you go on the field to start. You know, then be like, what are you nuts? This is your, your best, he's got to be there. So in lots of the fields that we're working in now, many of them like CTS and art, the arts, and things like that, these are, are things that you see, the drama teachers, they get it, right? Oh, that's what we do, is we work with these kids to produce the best possible student, and then we evaluate them at that time. When you're working with your kids, if you were on a master's thing, and I don't recommend it, but if you were on the idea of uh, even writing quizzes, we have teachers uh, that, that recommend to kids that, that um, you know, well, no, that's not true. I was going to go do this the other way around. We have kids that repress not writing quizzes, right? That, that we're going to do a quiz, I'm going to check for understanding. And because they still drop into the traditional model, they don't want to do that. Why don't they want to do that? Okay? If you're in a traditional grading system and your quiz counts, why would a kid skip the day of the quiz? Okay? Uh, because they're going to get 98 on the quiz? No. Right? They, so, I mean, the, the story that I tell about that, and the kids, they're coming to class, and you know, his friend says, oh, and did you study for the quiz today or the exam? Or it's like, oh, wait, it's today? Yeah, it's today. Oh, she hasn't seen me yet. I, I'm, I'm gone, right? And I'll get somebody to phone in and I'll play all these games around not writing that quiz. Why? Because they know that it goes in the grade book, they know that it counts, and they know they can never recover from that diminished mark. Okay? If, you have, if you're in an IB school and you have kids that skip your, your exam, and when I taught at McNally years and years ago, the, I was running my IB 20s and I, they were writing an exam, and I stepped outside the phone a parent about a kid who wasn't in my exam, and he was at his locker down the hall. I'm standing there saying, well, you know, and he's, oh, he should be at school. I said, yes, he should be at school. He should be, oh, never mind. He's right there. So I called him and brought him over. He's like, oh. I got caught. I said, why, why are you doing not in here? Right? This is 1984. So this is way before any transition. And this, he said, I was I wasn't ready. I had to work last night and they asked me to stay overtime. I didn't get any time to study for this thing. Now what do I say to him? Oh, just come in and give it a shot. You know? Well now we do. Now the kids come. Now in fact, the kids who who are, we have a quiz, and it's just to check for understanding, we go over it, we do some adjustments in our teaching, the kid comes back, they were absent that day, they come back the next day, they ask to write the quiz. The teacher said, no, no, it's okay, you know, we went over it, no. I'd like to do that because I'd like to know what I know. Honestly, that's remarkable. You know, it doesn't go in your grade book, it doesn't count. Yeah, I know, but I just want to know what I, what I, what I know. Can I write the quiz? <laughs> Courtney's class, so see this is 20 minutes to tell a two minute story, right? In Courtney's class, she ran with her 20 eyes, and Courtney asked me 300 questions in that semester about how to organize this, how to get the kids into it, how to get this done. On about December, at 8 or somewhere in that, in that day, she came to my office and she said, uh, can I ask you a question? I said, sure, number 304, why not? She said, I'd like to know what I do now. All of my kids are finished. All of their summative assessments are in, they've all been graded, and they've all passed. So now what do I do? Okay? I've got a couple weeks before Christmas, a couple weeks after Christmas, and I have no idea what I do with this group of kids. They are done. The thing that should make you weep in happiness as a teacher is she said, and at the end of the class, when they're celebrating the fact that they're done, it's the second, you know, the beginning of the second week in, in December, they've all passed. Two of the girls, and you've seen this, they do the slow book put away thing, right? Because they're not going to come and see you in front of their friends. They want everybody to leave. 
And so they do this thing, and they're hanging, and hanging, and everybody leaves. And they come up and they said, oh, Miss Forsyth, you know, thank you so much. We're so excited about this. And actually, we're talking about maybe if there's a possibility of moving to the Dash 1 stream for next year, because now I get it. And then they said, the other thing is, we don't believe that we did the best job on whatever one of the essays is, persuasive essay or something like that. We don't think we did the best job that we could. If we wrote another one for you, would you look at it? And I said, okay, that's incredible. We've got dash two kids that are finished the course, they're done, and they're asking you to, re to redo an assessment, you know, one of the parts. I said, well, what did you say? And she said, I, I didn't know what to say, so I just hugged them. Like, yeah, of course I'll look at your essay. Right? When it becomes about the learning, when, when we're not, you know, angsting about the fact that you missed a quiz, you missed this, you missed that, because I don't have that mark in my grade book, then all you're doing is you're talking about the marks. Then all the kids are doing is trying to accumulate marks. And that's not what it's all about. That will happen. Okay? Your magnificent classroom teachers teach. Let your kids learn. It will happen for you. Yes. Oh, she wants to know. I love the, I love the idea of the, it's almost like a portfolio learning for the assessment comes in, etc. That's right. Um, however, when it comes to the 30 streams, when you have kids that are trying to apply to universities, etc., they're often often having to use their mid-semester term marks. That's right. So how do you get around that? That's right. <laughs> so, and we do. We have to provide, in March, a, 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 a percent mark, right? So uh, I'm not even going to get into this whole argument about how we provide percent marks in, in school, because that is just lunacy, right? We, really, quite frankly, we have to, uh, if you think about it, for Rutherford scholarships. It's really the only place where that's required is that they need those percents in order to generate those, those grades, right? The, here's the, the thing that happens. The kids know from the conversations that we've had that the, the mark that they get in, in and it's actually the grade, but anyway, the, the number that goes on the report card in March is the best estimate of performance. Okay? The interesting thing is the teachers start to look at their coursework. All right? My English teachers love this because they get samples from the entire breadth of the course throughout the first month and a bit of the course. Kids are trying the essays, they're doing the poetry analysis, they've selected their novels, and they select their novels that they're going to do for the novel study. The, um, they, you know, there's, there's so much choice that's involved in this, but the teacher gets an idea of the full breadth of, of the course as much as possible and makes a prediction. There are IB schools here, right? You have to make predicted grades for your IB kids. How do you do that? If you've been an IB teacher for year, years, you've been making predicted uh, final assessment grades for your IB kids, and you just do it. You just know it. Right? So another interesting thing is I'll ask you this. Uh, when I do um, assessment sessions for leadership staff, you know, department heads and principals, um, I say, here's something uh, which is a very interesting exercise to go through. And I'd, I'd suggest that you even do this, and I'll get your question, right? When you come back from Christmas break, or even better, because you're working with your kids and you're in the milieu of working with your, your semester kids, before you get to leave for Christmas break, pull one class list of yours, okay? So if you follow this, pull one class list, and without looking at your grade book, write down what you think their final marks will be in your course. Okay? So I've done this in school after school probably over a hundred times. 
okay, with groups of teachers. Usually either the end of December or beginning of January or the end of May or beginning of June. And without their grade book, you just write down your final marks. I did this at Russia. I was the head of science there, as I've said to you a couple times now. I had 16 teachers in the science department. And at the beginning of June, I just got them to do this. Here's one of your class lists. Write down the numbers that you think. Think about this for a second. What do you think that looked like physically? Were they kind of like, oh, this guy, not in me, right? In the main, they just wrote down numbers. They pause for one or two of them, and they write down a number. Okay? So big deal. They wrote down numbers. What do you then what I did is I took those from them, so they didn't have them. They gave them to me. And when they generated their final marks in June, after all of the review, all of the exams, all of the things they did, when they generated their final marks, I took their final marks for that class and wrote them beside the ones that they wrote on the, like it was the third or fourth or whatever of June. Question for you, and I know you still have a question for me. Question for you, were they close? Were they all over the place? Were they, what do you, just, what do you think? Okay? They were almost identical. There wouldn't have been a statistical, or significant, whatever that thing is, there wouldn't have been a difference between those marks. Really? Think about all the questions that this brings up. So one of them said to me at our meeting in, at the end of August, well, what did we waste? June? I don't know, did you? Was there a point in going over all of that stuff? Did you actually improve achievement by going over, reviewing all of that stuff and having all of those things in your grade book? Did you? We'd like to believe that we do, because that's why we do it. That's why we have no field trips in June, and no, right, we have all of these things, because that's critically important time. No, the critically important time is all the time you spend with them until then. The learning is there. The learning is there. And it's demonstrated year after year, class after class, time after time. There's the odd kid, and you know who they are. They jump up with the, all of a sudden they get it. But in the main, those kids, their, their achievement levels have been set. Okay? That's, all, that's good and bad. Okay? You don't want to tell them that. Like, you're done, don't bother coming back. I didn't ask you a question, right? said on the flip side as a parent, which of course, right, the, uh, how do you know how your child is doing? That's right. So what would be your, your guess as to the, the number of parent concerns that I've had in the years I've done this? So two high schools, two junior highs, and one elementary as a principal and then all the schools that I worked as a teacher, but as a principal. How many phone calls? That, and that's over uh, 15 years. 800? 200? Billions? Zero. Zero. None. Not one. Why? Seriously. Not one. Not one single concern, okay? And I'll tell you from my perspective why. The, the parents know, and if you're a parent, think about this, this is my message to you. I am not going to punish the mark at the end of the year by the stumbles and mistakes that your kid makes during the learning process. That's not what I'm all about, okay? I'm about allowing the stumbles and mistakes because we always talk to them. You know, the best learning comes from the mistakes that you make. But don't make any mistakes because that will go in the grade book and it will count against you. Well, what if, I thought you said mistakes were important. 
You know, we want our ID kids to, to be risk takers. It's in, it's, it was on the document that was here. It's on the document from IB. But don't take any risks, because if you take a risk and you get a poor mark, it goes in the grade book and you can never get it back. So my parents know, and as my kids know, and in high school, my kids are the ones that tell their parents, as soon as there is a concern, it's like, don't worry about that. And all you need to do, remember the grade books look the same. It's got all the assessments and all the different activities and stuff in there, what they got out of what they could have got. Now there's things like we have uh, English teachers that, that will grade papers on using a plus equal negative. Okay? So you, you hand a paper in to me, I look at it, and I grade it as the, the equals is, yeah, you gave me what I asked for. The plus is you gave me more than I asked for, and the negative is there's some deficiencies here. Talk to somebody or me about what they might be. And that goes in the grade book. We got lots of data in there. There's lots of stuff in there. It's just that it doesn't count directly toward the final mark. It's all valuable information. And the parents know full well that it's a progression. And if they see the marks improving over time, they know that at the end, the best performances are the ones that will be used, or at least the end performances if there's no progression over time, right? Absolutely. The question was, did you find that they trusted you more as a professional? Because another thing, and I, you know, and I apologize for the fact that you can't get the whole picture of this in a, in an hour, right? But I, one of the most common things that I say is that the uh, absolutely essential thing we have to do as educators is we have to elevate the importance of our profession. I'm going to tell you that there, the people who are not teachers don't have the skill set. Right? Or don't demonstrate the skill set in their work that teachers do. Right? If you've ever worked in a volunteer group, and our superintendent used to talk about the fact that he volunteered with a group of men, all multi-millionaire businessmen because of, he lived in Twin Brooks or something like this, and they're running the Boy Scouts. Right? So there's what? There's like 27 kids in there? Big deal. And they want to be there? And there's eight dads. Well, you got a ratio like that? Are you kidding me? And the, the, these CEOs of these companies have no clue how to get those 27 boys to line up. No clue. And he, he said, my goodness, really you guys? You run multi-million dollar companies, you can't get 27 kids to get organized in here? It's like, stop, get on a number, Okay, even numbers over here, odd numbers over there. You know in the gyms where they have enough, it's just, this is, what do you, so do they trust us? Yeah. They, they trust the idea of professional judgment. Okay? The one thing that you know that, the, that your parents don't know is you know the curriculum, you know the, the standards. You do. Not them. What they want is the best part for their kid. Right? And all you have to tell them is, I'm the curriculum expert here. I'm the only one in the room right now that knows what this looks like when it's done really well. So you need, you know, it's like your doctor or your dentist. You know, they're, they're, that's the professional. I mean, you can go to your doctor the next time and he delivers a little bit of bad news and say, no, I'm not accepting that. Well, yeah, you can not accept that, but that's, in his professional judgment, this is, this is the decision that's being made. And they make mistakes, and so do we. And so do we. But we make mistakes in our professional judgment, not by allowing a grade book to tell me what the final mark will be. I'll ask you a simple question, then I'm gonna get this gentleman's question. If you have ever, in your career, okay, looked at a student's final mark and seen that as not correct, okay, yeah, it was correct by the calculation, but was that the true representation of their exit ability from your class? If you've ever done that, typically what happens, if you can in your grade book, is you kind of look around, make sure nobody's watching you, and change the number. Really? Because my teachers don't have a calculated mark, we have one weighted column in our grade book, and that number is put in 
physically by the teacher. So what lots of them do is they look at their body of work through the year, they'll wait some assignments to get a ballpark picture, right? At the end, they do that. Not at the beginning. I mean, seriously, you know the genetics exam should be worth 25% of your final mark. You know that before you even start the course? How did you know that? What if it sucks? What if the kids who all went, the whole school went through a, a, some episode and then you ran your genetics exam? You can't do that. But you do. You know, to me it's just, it, it's so refreshing to have something that puts the judgment piece on the teachers. It's magnificent. And the gentleman at the back has a question and has waited patiently for a long time. I do a bunch of this in my CTS courses, um, but one of my concerns is when you start with this as a whole school, it's not a concern about the ideo ideology and all that. Where are their problems? Does any new system, any change right. system has a problem? Right. And you've talked about the good stuff, and I'm all for it. I do it in a design class, kids can hand stuff back in, after right. you back to them. But where are their well, here's the problems, okay? So the, the problems aren't in your classroom. Uh, in the last three years uh, at McNally, uh, I've had one student sent from class for his behavior in class, right? The student is actually a uh, green tag. He actually has very severe mental illness, right? He just lost it that day. We don't have kids fighting with our teachers, right? Because uh, if you miss, you missed, right? So I mean, we could talk about lots of things. When, if you have in your record book, you know, uh, excusable and unexcusable absences, like seriously? So the kids will come to class and I missed the, the exam yesterday, can I do it tomorrow? Well, why were you awake? Oh, uh, and then I'm rattling through my brain, what is the one that he's gonna take here, right? And so I, why ask? Why does it matter? It's actually kind of a little bit of a joke when parents phone in. Because truly, and you know, the, they'll be marked, in, and I don't want to digress too much, but you know, is it an excusable absence that, the, that the, your student stayed home to babysit their younger brother and sister because they couldn't get a babysitter that day? Well, the parents will phone in for that. So parents still phone in and, and tell us that they know that the kids are away, but our um, student information system also sends an email to all the parents if the kids miss a class. I don't know if yours does or not, but ours does. So don't bother phoning. We know that they're away. You know that they're away. That's all that needs to happen. The problems are the kids finish classes early. Okay? Kids demonstrate their profic proficiency in classes and they're finished early. Last year, uh, we had a student uh, in grade 10 who finished her social studies 10 course uh, in the, uh, after a month and a half. She actually wrote an essay, uh, what she, what, and she, she said thank you, well, she wrote the materials that were required and got them done, and when she was done and the teacher said, okay, your mark is 100, thank you very much, uh, she said, oh good, because she's developing, the, and the math guys would have to help me, the, the idea of a thin thread that will accelerate a particle to the point that it'll put it into orbit, and she's working on the math of that. Like, are you kidding me? What you, and seriously, she is. And so now she gets the time to spend doing that. So the problems are that we start getting kids trickling out of class. Uh, in TOK today, there was a, uh, one of the uh, girls in my class came and she said, you know, I've got an exam in math that I, I'm really not ready for, and it's this afternoon, I'm wondering, yeah, sure, go do that. We have, because of the flexibility uh, um, project, that, you know, the high school redesign project, we dissolved the way the Carnegie unit for hours of instruction, so kids can finish early, or kids can finish late. We, the, the good thing about it, and high school principals would like to hear this, is we basically have no failures, because the courses don't end when the traditional end of course date is, that they, they just, they run until the, the student is done. Right? Sure. Yeah. 
Oh no, it's not a problem for you. It's a problem for the school administration, right? If those kids are off, they absolutely do. Try to give you the, the full picture of this. When we talk about flex weighted exams, it's literally flex weighted exams. There are situations where kids have been away for a while and they're coming in to write the exam. There, it's pointless that, well, no, it's not pointless, all right? If the decision is that the kid will wait until they're ready to get the best part they can in the exam, right, and, it, and on a rewrite or something like that, where there's all kinds of things that we do. One of them is they'll do uh, one off exams. A kid will come to the office and they'll sit in my office or you know, in the office and do that, that's, that's easy. The other thing that happens, is, and the teachers have said this to me, is that they've got kids that are, are making up exams after the fact, and they've given them tasks to do to, to get ready for it, and then they, they talk to them about readiness, okay? So, you know, I, I come to you and say, I, I'd like to write the physics exam this afternoon. I said, okay, I'm just gonna ask you a couple questions and see whether this is going to be worth our while, especially if it's a rewrite. You know, I don't want to do a rewrite if you haven't done anything about it and stuff like that. So how about this? Would you, what formula would you use to do this? And the kid nails it, right? Oh, okay, that was good. Let me ask you a harder question. You know, this, and the kid, yeah, I think I do this. And, oh, wow. Okay, I'm gonna, this is like top level. You get this, you've got this unit. And, you know, I ask him, the kid goes, yeah. Okay, I think what I would do is this, 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 and this, and the teacher in that three minutes goes, oh my goodness, okay. So then they come to me and say, do they have to write the exam? And, no, no, they don't have to write the exam. Remember, the exam doesn't go in the, into the grade book as a weighted exam, it's just information. And if you've already done all, all the gathering of information from that kid through that, that even three questions, and I, you might go, oh, you can't do the whole unit three questions. Well, whatever, all right, pick five, okay? But if you gather that information from that kid and you know that they're phenomenal at this, then what are you doing? You know, the, the, you've done your assessment. It's, it's done, you know, and I'm sure, you, you've got kids that demonstrate to you through their daily work high, high, high proficiencies in those units, you don't need them to write that exam. You don't need that written information in your grade book to know that that kid is top of the class or whatever. So why are you doing it? Like, I guess that's, and that's, and that's what, I didn't mean that tone on it. It's like, why are you doing it? You know, what's wrong with you? It's like, the question, simple question, why, why do we feel compelled to have to have that in our grade book, okay? Now, if, in, if divisionally, there is a requirement, uh, and I, I worked in schools where for each reporting period, the teachers had to have, the last one I worked in, they had to have 17 entries in the grade book for each of the four reporting periods. Isn't that lovely? Not a great divisional rule, so you take that one, it's beautiful, right? Because you know what will happen to the kids two weeks before the report card? In every single class, they'll be doing an assessment. Because you'll look and it's two weeks away, and you've got 12, it's like, oh, I got 10 classes and five assessments I need to put in here. Okay? It, 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 it's all just serving some vehicle that really quite truly and honestly takes the professional judgment piece away from you. I'll tell you that, that if your principal was told the day that you're coming in to do your report cards for the end of the year, the principal is told that the entire division system crashed and all the marks are gone. Okay? Or the, that all of your teachers are now out, right? They've all got sick and they can't be available. And I know that's kind of an artificial thing. The, you know, the simple question of this, 
and I'll, to, I'll make a statement rather than a question. At the end of the day, at the end of the course, if I have a choice between the information in the grade book and the information in the teacher's head, I pick the information in the teacher every time. That's where you cannot record, Albert Einstein actually said, and whether that's significant or not, that not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. But in traditional grade books, everything that can be counted counts. And so things like skills, which are difficult to test and to put a number on, get pushed to the side. And things like knowledge bits, which in my view, in very, very few courses are the significant part of the course. Right? That's, that's where the exams come from, that's where the marks come from, and we know that's not where the enduring learning comes from. Right? It really isn't. And so the front matter of the curriculum becomes phenomenally important, but phenomenally disregarded in our grade book. And that's not right. Okay? That sounded like a kind of concluding. But um, anyway, uh, I think we promised we'd let you out uh, a few minutes early. The, um, and because I, I don't even know whether I have another slide on okay? So is this just ridiculous? Our diploma results show no significant change over time, right? So this isn't the end all and the be all, right? This is, in, in my view, and as, as you're a high school principal, you know that, that um, the, the culture of your school is a very important aspect of, of school, right? If you have, uh, and so, the, you know, I, I, I Rhonda asked me if I'd bring some teachers to talk, and I probably should have. The, when they talk about just the feeling in the school, that the kids are self-directed in a much, much greater uh, sense, and you know, our really bright kids are doing really well. Our struggling kids are struggling to a certain degree, but they're not dropping out, which is an interesting thing. So rather than the diploma results, when you look at the course completions, in the last three years, We've had course completions all over 100% of our September 30th number. Okay? So kids finish early and take something else. And finish early. And you know the CTS guys, you're like, I can't get construction, I can't get, you know, I can't get this, I can't get that. And it's like, yeah, but if I finish my chemistry by the end of October, can I come into your, your construction class or something for a couple months? I love work. Absolutely. I, we'll do the safety unit and we'll get you in here because you want to be there. Right? I can't get you all the credits maybe. Whatever. We'll do whatever we can. They love it. My art teacher, my CTS teacher, my food teacher even. My all of them. The, matter of fact, last year I had a student who finished Math 30-3 early. Okay? And audited came into uh, TOK. If you're an IB guy, you know that. What? You, you, you did what? And Nathan, he, he played rugby for me, and he just said, "Hey, uh, Scope, you're uh, you do this like TOK thing?" I said, "Yeah, I've got that. Oh, I've got that period off now because I finished math 30-3. Can I come in there?" I went, sure, Nathan. 30 3 guy come in, you think, oh my goodness. The first day we're doing, first day he comes in, we're doing a Socratic seminar, and he goes through all the readings and stuff like that. And if you're familiar with Socratic seminars, there's six, in our class, there's six chairs in the middle for the people that are talking. He jumps into one of the inside chairs. Why not? Well, let's just do this. Right? So now you open up all of these worlds to kids that used to be closed. And they love it. They do. We have basically, I mean, I, I used to have three assistant principals uh, 
And in terms of the school discipline part, you know, I have two now, and we have basically no, certainly no in-school and certainly no in-class discipline issues that we deal with. It's fantastic. See, I should have said, because you probably would never look it up, oh, our diploma results have gone up incredibly. That's absolutely right. But the, there's no, it would have to be a statistical difference over time. And you also know, again, a high school principal, that, that each year we're talking about different groups of kids. And as much as the public doesn't like to hear that there are strong and, and weaker groups of kids, there are. You have, our grade 11s right now are magnificent. Like, magnificent. And so, I want to be the principal at McNally when they go through to the diploma part, right? But then that's just because of that group of kids. How are you doing? Are you anxious? I know the last thing I ever want to do is keep you out to the bell. And it's uh, 22, so it's three minutes before you even thought you'd get out. Well, thank you very much. It's been fantastic. Sparks some conversation and mostly if it uh, challenges a few of our thoughts. And I certainly think that uh, the PD this afternoon, led by uh, Dale, is, uh, has been very successful. I think I'd like to take a field trip over to McNally. So Absolutely. thank you very much. Anytime. And Teresa, we'd like to thank you too for hosting here at Trinity. Thanks a lot.